Yes, now it is. And you're talking on mute, but that's okay. I do not want to why it muted me. Um, now we're recording. Thank you. And thank you for letting me know I was talking on mute. I do that about three times a day. Uh, so, uh, first of all, for people who weren't here on the first one, this is an ITF session. It's covered under note well. Um, the uh, agenda, what we had today was to have, um, uh, Jan is going to produ produce some stuff. I'm not sure if he's here yet. He said he was going to be a few minutes late. Um, but when he arrives, we'll probably do that. Um, Yari, completely out of the blue, without telling you, I would love it if you could present your, your slide three on user behavior because it sort of fits right in here. I'll talk for a minute. But mostly I want to run today of just having a discussion around um, initially what sort of things happened with between the people trying to run applications on the internet and people trying to run the internet, um, whatever we can talk about with that. I think there's a ton of people on this call that do have information about th that type of environment. And then move into sort of broader things. The issues came up, what, what, what things come together. Um, I'd, I'd prefer to have this much more of a discussion today. Um, it was great to see all the papers and presentations uh, on Monday. It was super information, and but we didn't get enough time. We didn't get the time to talk about them. So I'm hoping some of that can come up and happen today. Uh, thoughts on this agenda? Other things we should insert, remove, deal with? So uh, it's. I, I was just wondering if we, if, towards the end, I think we should either tee up some topics for Friday or decide we don't need Friday, um, which is either could be possible. Um, and there is one topic I think that would be good to, to cover somewhere, which is you know, the part of this that was a success story. Uh, you know, if this pandemic had happened 10 years ago, we would have been totally screwed. Um, whereas the internet now could can do a lot more than then. So I, I think it might be useful to spend a few minutes reflecting on that and, and what we might want to write about that in a report or something. That that seems that makes tons of sense. Um, agreed. Um, so maybe uh, ten minutes around for that around that at the end. Um, uh, sure, it, that could be a topic for Friday, or, or sure, we, we'll, we'll put it some, it does put it somewhere out there. You know, it's amazing. Internet did not die. This is great. <laughs> and this actually goes back to the point that Brian raised on, on Monday. So was it all luck that we survived it or uh, was it not entirely pure luck? And I think the answer is like uh, half, half. Right. So it's 50% luck, 50% um, very good engineering. Look, I, 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 having seen, I, I mean, let's talk about that in, in the main discussion part of this a bunch today. I, I, I don't, I think there was a lot of things that were not luck at all and went amazingly well. So, um, I, I think it, I actually think it worked as intended. <laughs> <laughs> we have a vote at the end. <laughs> the, IB, the IB workshop will take a vote on whether the internet's a good thing or not at the end. I mean, it's not a biased sample set at all. But there was no luck. There's been many, many years of engineering to make it resilient, and it was just a little pow. You know? well, yeah. th there is a question whether, if this happened in a few years' time with current trends, uh, whether it would hold up as well in the future. If I inject something more theoretical, in the, I think it's in the control theory, there is a well-defined topic called HAT highly optimized tolerance. That says that for a given system, you can be, that can be engineered uh, with highly tolerant, highly optimized, but highly tolerant for given, um, given filler uh, phenomena of the well-known issues that uh, will fail miserably for unexpected conditions. Um, if I can find that paper, I can send you the quote. That'd be my comment. I think that, uh, you know, with ever increasing demand on the network, the system has been kind of well oiled 
to adjust to, to the surge of the traffic volume. So we, in that regard, have been doing really well. Well, look, let's jump into that when we get to the discussion part. That sounds interesting to hear about. Um, and uh, some people typing not on mute, so do mute if you're, um, if you're not speaking. Um, I do not see Donna here yet. Um, it's hard for me to see all of this at the same time. So, uh, Yana, I think you're not here. So, um, Yari, would you be willing to talk about uh, your, your slides here for a second? I'll put it up, the user behavior one, of just what you guys saw and how things were shifting on the applications? Yeah, it's going to be pretty short, but okay. Sure. Now can you display it from your end or? Yeah, I will. Skip the slides three then directly. So, I mean, for, for the background, the, these were slides that I've made just to sort of highlight the obvious point that th there's more to measurements than, than just the sort of, uh, you know, congestion or not uh, question uh, or traffic amount. It's also about the uh, qualitative changes and wh what people are actually doing and what, what's, what's happening with the the users and applications and so forth. And um, this was research not done by me, so I'm only reporting on other people's research, should be noted. Um, but it was research done by Ericsson. Uh, and they had interviewed, or our other group of researchers had in interviewed 11,000 people in various countries uh, throughout the world and uh, asked about many different kinds of things. And, and one of the things that they asked about was how did you, um, what, what kind of applications were you using? So I have some measurements on, on some of those things, but I believe this one was uh, based on the questionnaires. And so um, on the X axis is the, the amount of uh, user change or a number of users being changed in a particular category of things. And uh, on the Y axis is the uh, actual usage uh, change. So. Um, and you, you would see some obvious things, uh, not unexpected, like uh, ride hailing and travel applications were not particularly useful um, this year. And then uh, remote working, e-learning, um, health applications, COVID-19 apps, and so on were uh, quite popular. Um, so I'm not really sure there's much more to say about this. This is sort of you know, one, one view of things, like what, what did people actually do? And of course, there's some conclusions someone could draw. Maybe, Colin, if you briefly show the next slide. We'll yeah, sure. Two more things. Um, so, so you can sort of theorize, like, what, what actually was behind the thing? Like, you know, if, if we succeeded in something, you know, why was it uh, luck or, or some, some other things? But, but one of the things that can sort of see myself at least that this you know cloud CDN type deployment methods were a big factor in being able to move different applications around. And you know networks is one thing, but you know how does one application grow rapidly and the other one uh, doesn't get any usage? And that would not have been possible uh, 10, 15 years ago because everybody was running on their own hardware, and that would have been very painful. Um, should also mention that they also asked about things like uh, what um, what did they, people feel about their uh, fixed broadband or uh, mobile broadband, and relatively positive answers, or you know, is sixty percent positive or seventy five percent your call? But uh, people were relatively satisfied with their fixed broadband and felt that mobile broadband was. At least as good that it was before the crisis. Now, you know, I wish they had asked exactly the same questions, and maybe both questions on both uh, groups. They didn't. Um, and this may have to do with, uh, uh, with, you know, previous questions people have asked in the, in the same uh, questionnaire before. But uh, so th this is by no means like a full full understanding of the of the space, and it was still a relatively small sample. But it's an interesting sample, and people in general felt that. Uh, IT, ICT technologies had have helped, but there's obviously lots of questions. Like, did they help enough? Like, <laughs> suddenly our needs are much much bigger for uh, for ICT. So, should they have helped even more? That's maybe a question. And um, there's also I should mention that there's some 
potential long-term impacts based on like, what people uh, started doing, like new new user groups like the elderly uh, used new applications. And so that, that's probably going to affect the future, not just uh, this year's behavior. And then lots of people care about resiliency. So, yeah, I think that's it for me. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I, I thought that, you know, when sort of, you know, key things on this, we just saw so much shift to, um, you know, a ton of internet usage from an application point of view. Uh, and, we, you know, you saw that in a, in a bunch of the papers that were presented sort of talked about, you know, those types of points. Uh, one thing I'll say from the, the area that I was working in um, was was around as one WebEx, but all of the web conferencing systems, um, so the three major ones are, are well, the probably three largest are, are Microsoft, Zoom, and WebEx. Um, and they they all saw incredible growth in their, their usage. Um, in fact, similar incredible growth on that. There's there's we don't have the data out. We can't show the data yet, but the uh, synergy as a research firm has data from all those companies. We'll show how they all compare and how they all grew. But when that data comes out, you can see from that data they all had sort of similar growth. Um, the the overall issues there as, as we rolled that out was was um, it, you know I sort of watching over the last couple of days where we discussed it sort of seemed like oh well we had a you know in fact I'm going to stop sharing this slide here. We had a uh, a fifteen or twenty percent improve our increase in network traffic. It's sort of what we saw different several presentations over the last couple of days or on Monday, and uh, you know th that's is certainly true. Um, but I th definitely from the point of view of I think of the video conferencing vendors, um, that that was a real problem. All kinds of places we had incredible numbers of systems that didn't have enough bandwidth. Areas where we we're having really uh, network performance issues. So. The major video uh, providers on the internet, um, YouTube and the rest, um, I mean, they reduced their bandwidth in most locations by 25%. That made an incredible difference to everyone who was trying to do video conferencing or or um, remote learning through through these video conferencing applications. So I think there was a lot that made that happen, but I think it's well worth discussing a little bit and just reflecting on you know what it would take to make that to happen, and, and it had a huge impact to the the quality, the, you know, to being able to deliver um, usable video conferencing systems. Now over time, of course, people uh, extended the capacity of their networks, scaled their networks. We're now back to a situation where uh, those those systems have gone back up to the full bit rates they were before. Um, but I think that's one of the sort of areas that uh, I'd like to talk a little bit, you know, hope we can talk a little bit more about when we get to the discussion part of this. So, uh, I think um, with that, maybe I see Yana is here now, so maybe we should jump into your slides. Do you want to present your slides yourself or I can put them up if you want, but probably works better for you to move them forward. Oh, uh, thanks, Colin. Um, I, I'm happy to do either, whichever one is more convenient. You present them all. Okay, let me do that then. Uh, just give me one second. <clears throat> and apologies for being late. It's a bit of an insane hour out here. <laughs> As you know, I don't quite know if I can do this full screen. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go to. Yeah, hang on. It's taking forever. I don't know if you're seeing all of my Chrome windows, aren't you? Luckily, we're only seeing the one that's in front right now. Or where, yeah, we got to see all of them. <laughs> There's only one we can actually really use. So. <laughs> well, uh, we'll just run with, okay. run with this, I suppose. Uh, if I, I can't, I am not going to try and do better than this. Um, at any rate, I uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about these with this data. I'm going to try and um, go through this uh, in about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so at a high level, we 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 monitored and we were obviously so so. Uh, uh, let me start off by saying who I am. Uh, I'm Jana Iyengar. I'm a distinguished engineer at Fastly, which is an edge compute slash CDN. Company, we we uh, uh, so I work on networking and transport performance, and I'm part of the ITF and IRTF, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but more importantly, about Fastly itself, uh, we we serve a lot of traffic to customers. We serve a lot of traffic for customers. 
to users around the world. So obviously, we were sort of at the forefront of the uh, uh, a lot of the, the 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 effects of what we saw happen uh, with COVID in terms of internet traffic. Uh, uh, and so I'm going to talk about that in these slides today. Uh, feel free to stop me as I'm going through this and ask questions. I may not be able to spend a lot of time answering them, but uh, I'll, I'll be very happy to uh, answer them quickly if I'm able to do that then. So at a high level, through this, this is so this data is basically around uh, the early period of uh, COVID times. We don't have a ton of, uh, I don't have anything to show right now, even though I've been tracking it uh, since then. I don't have a lot to show since then. But just to start off with, this is uh, a high level uh, difference in traffic uh, trends between a week in, uh, um, so basically comparing two weeks earlier in the year, January to February, versus February to March. And the idea here to show you the difference between organic traffic growth uh, versus what we saw happen during uh, the early part of COVID. And these are different verticals, uh, as they call them, um, streaming, digital publishing, social media, uh, gaming, etc. And you can see that there's a significant increase, especially in digital publishing and in ed tech or education technology. Uh, one can infer what uh, the, the, the sort of natural uh, uh, reasons why these happen. Obviously, people were uh, going to new sites and various things a lot more, and also using as people were children were driven home, students were driven home. They were using online uh, um, means of learning, such as Khan Academy and others, a lot more. Do you mind going full screen on the slides, please? Uh, I don't mind. I it didn't seem to work. Uh, there. Is this working? Ah, better. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, so the, uh, so that's a high level analysis of just total amount of traffic that we saw increase. And now I'm going to dig a little bit into, uh, uh sort of the dynamic changes in traffic as we saw them happen through time. Um, we investigated a, a number of things. I'm, I'm going to limit this to just a, a few things that we saw there. So we wanted to look at the, the sheer in change in traffic volume across regions. We wanted to see how that matched up with different events that were happening. As you remember, in March, basically different countries and within the U.S. different states were basically doing things at different times. They would announce different things. They would announce as, as COVID cases increased or changed uh, uh, in that particular region. They would have um, um, uh, shut down schools, for example, uh, and um, you know, send people home, lockdowns, various other events that happened. We were trying to see if we could see reflections of those in our traffic. And so, like I said, at first we wanted to see uh, the reflections in traffic volume. And more importantly, we wanted to find out if the internet was holding up. I don't know if you remember, but around that time, again, a lot of articles around, you know, is the internet going to keep up with all of these people going home and doing everything from home? So uh, even a lot of our customers and, and, and investors and others were quite interested in this question. So we wanted to look and see what happened to internet quality, so to speak. And and for the, for the geeks in the room, which is all of you, uh, this is basically, uh, we were... Uh, what what I decided to do was to use uh, uh, TCP delivery rate from TCP info that we record at our servers uh, as a reflection of uh, download speed. So even though the absolute number may mean something slightly different, the change in the number means uh, a lot more. And it, we expected to track effectively what the TCP connections see as download speed to uh, to users. So what you see here as download speed in the in this in the following graphs is basically um, um, TCP delivery rate. Uh, the mean TCP, I, I think it's the mean or the median. It is said in different graphs, but it's it's some measure based on TCP delivery rate to users from our servers. Um, so uh, at a high level, again, we saw traffic volume change dramatically. Pretty much went up everywhere uniformly, um, and some countries like Italy. Uh, this is between a week in Feb and a week in March, so one month period. Uh, the, 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 the change was just dramatic. Uh, this was a period when also Italy went into complete lockdown. So again, for, for a good reason, the traffic went up. We could explain the uh, increase here. Uh, but the download speed didn't uniformly go down everywhere. It did go down in some places, but it actually went up in some places. Like in Japan, for example, it went up by 10%, which is 
because my only answer is it's Japan. But um, but but yeah, I mean the infrastructure definitely did hold up in many places. Um, so I'll walk through these in just a little bit more detail. I don't have a lot of time to walk through all of them, so I'll show you just a couple of graphs and move on to the next uh, topic. So here's an example, which is with the UK. Just a few things here before I start off. The x-axis here is time, uh, and that's going from February 27th to March 30th, about a, a month-long period. The blue curve, if if I'm sorry if you're not able to see the colors very clearly here, the blue curve is the one that's rising up. It's the one that has a positive, roughly positive slope, uh, um, not the exponential one. But the roughly positive slope is basically uh, uh, the uh, the change in traffic volume. The corresponding, roughly corresponding mirrored green curve is is the red curve here for context is what's it, Matt? Change in tra traffic volume is year over year or month over month or. Uh, the change in traffic volume is based on uh, percent change from February 27th. So February 27th is our reference point. It's it's an arbitrary time, uh, but yeah. The red curve is simply uh, the COVID cases, and that's on the uh, right axis. So you can see sort of how what happens to traffic volume and download speed uh, as things happen. Now, the one thing I'll, I'll note is that we don't really talk about the, the summaries at the end, but at a high level, we can see various things happening. Um, uh, you can see these vertical lines here. The first one says travel restrictions, and that caused when travel restrictions were announced in the UK, that caused a bump in traffic volume and a corresponding decrease in, in delivery rates, as we saw. Similarly, schools closing and the country lockdown caused even more dramatic change in slope uh, in terms of the increase in traffic volume. Um, and we saw again a corresponding decrease in, in, in delivery rates. Um, as you can see here, there's sort of a rough mirror here that you could definitely seem to suffer a fair bit from, from, from the increase in traffic volume in terms of the infrastructure being able to support the increase there. Uh, a couple of things I'll note. Um, here you can see the, the weekly patterns. The bumps are weekends and the flat flatter areas are the weekdays. That sort of disappears when the travel restrictions happen. So I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, that's the UK. This is Italy. Um, I won't go into the details here. Again, we can walk down and sort of see minor bumps uh, and some significant ones, but the biggest ones we see are with school closures, announcement and school closures. Um, we see a bigger bump happen there dramatically in time. Again, quality of the internet did go down, but again, not to the same extent as the increase in traffic volume. So that tells us something. Um, I've got France here similarly. Uh, and again, even though it's ha things happen later in time in France, with school closures and schools closing, you can see a dramatic increase in traffic volume. Um, it, it, it does make sense because, you know, with, with, with schools closing, not just do the children move home, but parents move home too. So pretty much everybody's moved home and everybody's moved doing work from home. And we believe that the decrease in, in, uh, um, in download speeds or delivery rates is a reflection of how the residential ISPs were able to deal with and cope with this increase in traffic uh, uh, at homes as against uh, ISPs that were serving enterprises. Uh, of course, in France, you don't see as much of a decrease in, in, in delivery rate, and uh, that's a high level. Now, there are two more things here I just want to note. The Netflix and YouTube both announced that they would, they would in Europe at least, they announced that they would reduce the default uh, streaming quality to a lower uh, value. That in our in our numbers didn't seem to make much of a difference i mean what we would expected that to do is to have increased the delivery rate of our traffic which is not youtube or your netflix but it didn't really seem to um that's true across various countries as we see them in europe um that's probably uh, just just for what it's worth again i note that because i think that uh one of one of the things i take away from that is that abr is working well that's all I take away from that. I don't know that Netflix and YouTube had to do anything special there. I think it just seemed to adapt and work well. Um, I won't go into the the main of the countries here. Uh, Japan is Japan is a bit of an anomaly. Uh, it does see a similar sort of a loss of diurnal, uh, not diurnal, but weekly patterns in traffic. Uh, traffic volumes do increase to weekend levels, and just weekend levels remain sustained. 
uh, we lose completely that signature of weekend weekday things. But uh, I couldn't quite put my finger on it. I couldn't find anything there. But um, yeah, delivery rate actually went up, which is you know fantastic to see. I think the residential ISPs that really stepped up. Um, that's all I've got. Uh, within again within the US, it was regional, so we had to do state by state analysis, and, and you see similar things happen in the US as well. So high level takeaway from this set of graphs is that uh, traffic increases were triggered by public policy announcements. We were thinking that maybe you know one of the things we were hoping to see, or not hoping to see, but expecting to see, was that as COVID rates increased, we would see people automatically shift this. But it wasn't. So COVID cases didn't really reflect in traffic. What reflected in traffic were the public policy announcements, which kind of makes sense again because public policy announcements are discrete events in time, um, and so those are the ones that we were able to see very distinctly. Uh, quality degradation, however, was more gradual um, as people shifted homeward. People increased their activity at home and tried to figure out, get their feet on the ground, and so on. We saw track quality degradation happen. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that next, um, and. The line between weekdays and weekends disappeared. This probably reflects how what our experience has been since March. One of my uh, friends, Nick Harper, created a website uh, called March2020.date. Please go take a look at it. It tells you what the current date is in March. I think today is March 256, 2020. That's how people feel. And that's basically what uh, uh, there's just been this continuity in time um, that, that things have there's no the, the, our, our normal patterns of usage our normal usage our normal experience of time has changed quite a bit um and uh yeah the internet seemed to keep doing well uh mostly thanks to elasticity and i'll uh we can talk about that more later as well uh i'm going to go back to this quality degradation question very briefly uh because we wanted to ask the question of there is some degradation we do see it um, it, we've been able to still serve traffic. Things are still doing well, but clearly there is some degradation. The question was, how do we, is this degradation equal? Are we having, how is this degradation uh, distributed? So we had to sort of uh, limit this uh, to, to US alone. Uh, I did not do this for other regions, but at a high level, the way I approached this was to, to look at uh, the US and, and divide it up into five different income regions based on uh, income per zip code. So this is five, five digit zip. And I was able to get the data from IRS uh, data in, in BigQuery and, and, and uh, um, uh, uh, other data that allowed me to basically figure out what the what the incomes were. I created these income uh, zones, uh, which were informed by a few things. But basically splitting up the US into these five zones, so to speak, a lot also then look at delivery rate local to uh, those zones <clears throat> or these or these zip codes. So uh, just to be clear again, we divided uh, uh, five digit zip codes in the US were categorized into one of five different income levels, lowest to highest. Um, and that should not be median income. That should be, I think, medium. Uh, that's a that's a typo there. Um, and then we looked at the delivery rate, the same TCP delivery rate or download speed uh, uh, to those zip codes, to those aggregates. Um, and here's a high level picture of uh, median download speed within a zone or a, an income level across time, the same X axis as time. And Y axis here shows you five different curves. Each one of them is the evolution of the median download speed or delivery rate uh, across time. The one thing that really struck us, I mean, I did some filtering here to be clear, some filtering here to avoid like, you know, large players like traffic going to uh, other CDNs or traffic going to Google Cloud or things like that to avoid those, uh, remove those anomalies and, and filter this out to only residential ISPs and so on, mostly. Uh, the one thing that's that completely was, was, was uh, uh, huge for us to see uh, so starkly was that delivery rates actually line up with income levels exactly. And that's just, to me, was stunning because if these income levels were not created based on our ability to differentiate delivery rates. We based them on completely different things. And then we pulled this data out and these five lines, non almost practically non-intersecting five lines, and you can see the bottom two lines, curves, sorry, start to intersect towards the end. And I'll talk about that in the next slide in a moment. 
But the fact that these five or at least four regions sort of are very clearly stratified tells us something quite important. The fact that high income level zip codes do get for reasons, for reasons of capacity and for reasons of uh, capability, um, higher delivery rates and download speeds. That tells us something here. So, uh, however, what we were what we were looking to see was if the degradation was 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 distributed unevenly, and we don't see that. We actually see the bottom download speed uh, go up for the bottom regions, and that is actually interesting. So we dug in a bit more, and and we found this. So this is Comcast, and I want to call out uh, uh, these companies here because. You know, operators get a bad rap all the time, and they actually did something really good here. Um, Comcast announced at some point that uh, they would increase the speed of the lowest tier of internet access called Internet Essential, specifically for low-income families and so on. Um, they would increase the speed, and they made it freely available for at least three months. And we saw, corresponding to that, we saw an increase in download speed in those regions which is you know, just great to see in the data here. So the bottom two curves actually rise up there in the second week of March, and they're exactly aligned with the announcements that they made. And uh, uh, similarly, uh, Cox Communications also did something quite similar. And you can see that there, they basically completely eliminated the gap between these income regions. Um, so uh, I will uh, end on this note that uh, we 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 managed to we managed to stay afloat. Like the internet has 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 for a number of reasons. And Patrick McManus, a colleague of mine, has written a really good blog post about what are the key reasons why we think we survived uh, the the volume increase and the barrage of traffic that we saw uh, through this, these times. But um, we've we've done well, and I think I think that uh, uh, we were expecting to see. Um, not so many signatures, but we saw a lot of signatures in the traffic for various events. Um, but in terms of degradation, in terms of a quality of internet access, uh, it is clear that that that's work to be done. That we can make more equitable distribution possible, uh, and it's it's also clear that ISPs have a fair amount of power uh, and ability to close this divide. Uh, the fact that they were able to uh, 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 give increase the 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 quality meant that. They had the the fiber at the, at the base level available in those regions, right? The capacity was available in those regions. They were simply not opened up, and the fact that they were able to do this and and and, and change qualitatively the uh, experience for a lot of people says a lot about uh, the power that ISPs have to do this. So, I will um, leave with a link to these two blog posts, which which describe these these uh, graphs in more detail, um, and. Uh, that's all. I think I've gone over time. I'm sorry if I did. No, that's, that's, that's good. So uh, let's just start with, you know, questions about Jan's presentation or, or anything we want to talk about. So I, I, I did the Q plus thing in the, in the WebEx chat. I don't know if we're doing that today, but we can. That's what. Uh, so John, I have a question about the last point you made there, about uh, ISPs being able to kind of improve the kind of equity um do we know if that kind of cost them anything or have they continued that um, or do they kind of pull, call a halt to it at some stage um you know is, so i is there, is there an ongoing kind of possibility around this or is it just a kind of a pandemic response once off Right. So I look to see if uh, for both Comcast and Cox, I look to see what happened to this. Like they were supposed to have offered this free for three months. Um, so I look to see, like, you know, I had a thing on my calendar to go back and check and see if after three months, the whole thing tanks. Um, and it did not, um, which tells me that maybe the tra the, the increase uh, in, in uh, delivery rates or the increase in uh, I don't know what I can't remember what they increased it from into the the cap of uh, uh, bandwidth that they were offering. I think that stayed in place is my guess, and I'm guessing that that increase in bandwidth, rather more than the the free offering, uh, made a difference. So uh, I've seen that uh, um, be in place after that. Like I checked two months after they said they would close, and they still remained in place. Whether there was a cost to them. 
I reached out to Comcast. I didn't get a response, so I can't really speak for them. If there is an ISP on the call here who can speak to this, I would also appreciate hearing an answer uh, to that. Uh, Oliver? Yeah, uh, really cool stuff. Um, I was wondering, so regarding the uptake um, for the lowest income bracket, um, so could this also be an artifact of people moving from a mobile network towards residential home networks? So did you basically distinguish between the, the network type as well? I did not. In this case, I did not. Uh, although we, I did do some digging, not in these graphs, they're not distinguished. I did look around a little bit to see mm. mobile networks were, it was weird. I mean, I'll be honest <clears throat> because, you know, it's like suddenly traffic over mobile networks in Manhattan, uh, the, the quality increased <clears throat> probably because there are very few people using it. You know, so, yeah. so, so we saw some interesting signatures there, but nothing significant enough here to show. I think pretty much more, this data is probably going to be dominated by um, uh, by residential networks. To your question of whether there were more mobile at home, uh, I, I, then maybe. I, I have to admit that I didn't really dig deep, deep, deep into that. Yeah, so I, I think it would be really interesting to see uh, basically splitting this up, uh, just, just looking at the residential home, home part and seeing whether we see an increase there as well or, or where it remains uh, more or less stable there. Yeah, I think one of the really nice things that one of the things I would, I would have loved to have had is uh, AS numbers with <laughs> network type. <laughs> yeah, instead of sure. going around guessing and digging in because it doesn't. <clears throat> the problem of classifying ASs does not scale. I would love an automated way of doing that. Yeah, thanks. I think another thing to remember is that the ISPs don't want to roll trucks to upgrade a customer service, and so the service tiers are all different in software. Yeah, put the same equipment everywhere, and you put knobs in it. And, and I think that's that's part part of the question there, right? Like, was was whether whether they needed to. Sorry, Matt, I thought you were done. Yeah. Said so it's, it's it's to some extent the service tiers are artificial; they're not intrinsic to the infrastructure or programmed. Yeah, I think the data in the in the last two graphs that I showed actually demonstrates exactly that. But they had to turn a knob somewhere, and and things got better, right? Which is why I think that there's there is there's capacity sitting there, but there's a cost to using that capacity. That's not clear to me. Um, uh, Andrew, yeah, just picking up on that point first. Um, obviously, it depends what type of network you're talking about. That's absolutely true for a cable network or for a, an FTTP network might be a little more challenging on an XDSL network um, because a lot of the ISPs on those networks don't necessarily have different speed tiers. Um, so they don't have the same capability necessarily. Uh, and I appreciate it does vary in different markets, but certainly in some markets, they won't have the ability to just turn up the tap. Um, it would require a truck roll of some description. Um, but clearly where they're, where it is software defined, I completely agree with the point that, uh, that you know, then it's discretionary on the uh, uh, ISP. Um, and Jason will confirm offline whether there's any costs involved in, in that. Um, just a sort of second point, just to which I think covered something which uh, you know, as either you or Yari sort of mentioned. You, you, I think you both mentioned, in fact, about Netflix uh, and others maybe degrading their sort of uh, resolution f for a while. Some of the ISPs I talked to at the time were slightly puzzled about that because it wasn't really giving them a challenge um, so much on the, their networks. And again, I'm sure there are exceptions to that. The one thing which did cause some challenges, though, um, certainly for the European ISPs, uh, was some of the big, uh, big game downloads where there were sort of, uh, in, sort of new versions of games coming out. Um, a lot of those tend to land um, or tended to land on Tuesdays in particular, I think, in, in Europe, which for those of you that are not in Europe, um, at that time of year, that conflicted with some of the big sporting events, Champions League, for those of you in, in, in Europe. So on some networks, they had they, they were experiencing peak load anyway. So then getting game downloads on the same evening 
was causing them um, so uh, some some congestion challenges. And I think there was some discussion with the gaming industry to try and have a better coordination between ISPs and the gaming industry to avoid stressing networks unnecessarily just by picking different times or different days um, to uh, put out their, uh, their, their their latest versions of, of, of the Call of Duty or whatever. Um, so I mentioned that as I don't think that's come up before. Yeah, Call of Duty is a bit of a killer, isn't it? Uh, Jared? Oh, I, I thought there was somebody else in between. Uh, oh, Brooks, yeah, did I miss someone? It may have been my mess up. Did it? Andrew? No, I think, I think it's you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, so two things. So, so one, uh, wearing my Akamai hat. You know, we carried a lot of the streaming events as well as the game uh, downloads. Um, so, so we definitely uh, worked with our customers, you know, so, so one of the tricks of being a CDN is that your customers come to you and say, hey, we're releasing this game at this time um, for download. And everybody around the world, either if they pre-purchased it or something, the consoles just start downloading the traffic. Uh, you know, you know, they'll, you know, the consoles basically have foreground and background uh download method so it, it really depends on how the game publisher uh you know releases uh you know re re releases it and the timing of that and that's something which as a cdn you actually don't have a lot of control over because you know they release it whenever they release it um and and, and that makes it incredibly challenging what what happened earlier you know so what had there been a trend that started in 2019 like the tail end of 2019 with game downloads being rep, you know, kind of increasing in speed and frequency, uh, you know, about every two to three weeks, you know, somewhere between three to four weeks, there would be a new, you know, either Call of Duty or, or you know, or whatever uh, update that would show up. And we, uh, we definitely uh, were one of the network, one of the CDNs that was ser serving a lot of that traffic. Um, and so we worked, together with both the, the game publishing people as well as with ISPs to identify, you know, kind of a better time globally uh, to, to do many of the, you know, to do many of the download events um, and started to, uh, you know, nudge these folks to release things or to post them more off hours such that uh, the load would shift basically to nighttime hours when most people were, uh, you know, were sleeping at least for those. So, so that's, uh, you know, th that's a big thing. It's, uh, you know, there's always new gaming <laughs> event downloads. I'm expecting there to be many during the holiday season, especially as people get new consoles and the PS5, PlayStation 5 comes out as well. So, so that's going to, you know, that's going to be really interesting. And then uh, the second thing is, uh, because of the failure of broadband in my area, so I'm, I'll switch hats. I built a little fiber to the home network uh, to kind of service myself and, and, and other uh, folks around here because people at Comcast didn't build uh, into the area despite having infrastructure close. And AT and T, you know, uh, AT and T offers an amazing 1.5 meg DSL to my home, uh, you know, from their service system. So, so given that. Um, it's been really interesting for me to observe as people get access to high, good quality uh, internet connectivity is, you know, where I'm, I'm now delivering high speeds to them to watch that traffic, uh, you know, watch that traffic pick up uh, for many of these events. And uh, it's, it's been, uh, it's been something enjoyable for me to see as, as part of that. But the, the, uh, the gaming download thing has just been, you know, uh, it kind of was one of the additional straws on the camel's back this year and in combination with, with everything else. So I, I, I believe Fastly also served a lot of gaming stuff as well. Yeah, we did. Uh, thanks for that. Colin, do you mind if I jump in here or? Go ahead, yeah. Um, I, yeah, so, so yeah, we definitely have to do a lot of dancing around those things. So somebody asked the question of why are gaming downloads different? Gaming downloads are, are different in, in only that they uh, exercise one particular muscle of a CDN, uh, 
uh, extensively. So it's basically large file downloads. It's like a DOS attack. Everybody arrives at the same time and downloads this giant file. Um, so CDN's traffic is not like that normally. You know, it's all file downloads and it's all you know uh, web pages. It's usually short connections because web pages are uh, smaller pages and so on. And this is not like streaming either because the client isn't adapting. Uh, Congestion control is shining here to the extent that it is able to, and there's a lot of failures there. So we do see a lot of basically that sort of uh, uh, play out. Um, so it's a very particular muscle that gets exercised here, and um, you have to prepare for it differently. It's not the normal mix of traffic that we usually see. And typically what happens is with these really large file downloads, the things that suffer are the small connections and the web, web page uh, loads. And so we had to sort of do dances around that to make it work well. Yeah, and and just to comment a little further on that, the client behavior is really interesting of how different consoles and different systems will fetch it as one large file versus fetch it in chunks. Um, and, and so you get you get this varying behavior. So like an Xbox behaves differently than you know a Switch than something else, and so the, those varying client behaviors, you know, make it look a lot more. Sometimes a lot more BitTorrent esque, or you know, the file sh you know the file sharing systems versus you know just one linear TCP stream. And then obviously, you know, of other people have researched and, and talked about you know the impacts of buffer blow and you know the ability to do better queuing, like the the, the fair QB Codel or uh, uh, Toddle stuff. So so that that really makes a big diff that can make a big difference on the client side experience as, as well. Um, if the, if that's being implemented in the CPEs, but yeah, it's and like I said, and then the consoles behave differently for background download versus one where it's user user initiated, and usually usually the user initiated ones it it you know it tries a lot harder to download faster. So there, there's a lot of different subtle behavior differences here. So I want to jump in on the comment about the. Uh, about the, the people, the network seeing no problems. So a lot of um, when we were we were seeing a lot of problems in a lot of networks before YouTube and Netflix uh, dropped stuff. Uh, and by problems, we mean we're measuring on a time when the user experience of the video and audio was impaired in some significant user, you know, significant way, like you know, multiple seconds, uh, you, you know, it per, you know, more than a second per minute, where you're where there's like significant loss or quality artifacts. And all the major video conferencing providers substantially reduced their bandwidth to try and fight against that. And it just wasn't enough. It was getting to the point where people were talking about turning off video altogether, which would have really impact on remote learning. Now, when we went and talked to the network operators, they're like, was often on many cases was, no, we're not having any problems with our network. They're looking pretty good. And we're like, it's looking pretty bad to us. And they're like, well, look at our throughput rates. They're looking fine to us. And we're like, well, look at what happens to any real time media. Like, let's set up a, a VoIP call. And it's like, oh, yeah, that does look pretty bad. So I think there was some questions of measurement there. Now, I got to say that every uh, network operator we contacted or, or talked to was amazingly awesome about working with us, trying to fix the problem, doing everything. Like, everyone just ignored the money, ignored the politics, just was like, yeah, we need to make this work for users. What can we do to make things better? So it was amazing from that point of view. And I think a lot of that came from relationships out of Nanog or um, ITF or other things where you could directly figure out a technical person to call inside of a company and they took the effort to get you to the right person who could solve your problem. So that was amazing. But I, I think we do need to, it made me think that, you know, we need better ways to understand uh, for the network operators to measure their impact on different applications, not just on the, 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 the download throughput. And I think a lot of people did try and um, figure out what they needed to do to to keep uh, app, keep the the remote learning and the web conferencing applications up. Um, so some of the traffic did split separately that way. Um, so I, I you know let's talk about that a little bit in the second session here of you know what, what can we do to improve those types of things. If, if I could jump in there, Colin, thank you for that comment. I think that's actually I don't I mean. I, I didn't mean to suggest that our viewport is limited, uh, and I yeah. totally appreciate uh, your point there. We don't we don't have any metrics on on real time traffic, and we certainly didn't have client side uh, metrics in here, so we couldn't really 
tell what was happening on the client. Uh, but yeah, that point is actually, uh, it's a very good point. For the longest time, at least with operators, I think the, the, the measurements are limited and being known this, even for, even for YouTube. Uh, oftentimes throughput is used as a measurement of how well YouTube, for example, is doing, and that's not good enough. Um, and I've seen this time and again uh, with operators looking at what I think of as micro metrics or micro, not micro benchmarks, but they are micro metrics. Throughput is a micro metric. Your hope is that you're using that to reflect something that is, you're hoping that that reflects quality of experience at the, at the user, but in a lot of cases it doesn't. And look, I mean, it'd be a great thing if we came out of this going like the hard things are, you know, classic web page usage, are da games download, are, uh, you know, video conferencing. Are, like we came up with a list of things and, and figured out different types of metrics for them. So anyway, I want to stop. I want to power over, hand over to Anant here. Um, hey, yeah, thanks. Um, so quick question for Jenna, and I think Jared touched a bit on this. So I was looking at the same data uh, from another CDN side, the GCP info data. Now, but instead of delivery delivery rate, I was looking at RTT and retransmits, um, and I it, there was the difference that was previously mentioned. Like the wireless providers seem to have kept up well um, than uh, the wired. But one interesting thing that at least I saw in some of the data that I looked at was I saw more fluctuations in RTT than retransmits, uh, and I wonder if you guys saw that too. And what does that kind of mean in terms of deep buffers and the games we play with congestion control from the CDN side, uh, and how could that impact going forward when we see these things, and what can we do to like tune down some of those uh, parameters uh, if we know that there are more deep buffers out there than we think there are? Jana, do you have any comments on that? Um, I did look at RTT, and, uh, and I. I'd love to look at your data. Uh, at a high level, though, to your point of what can we do, I don't know that we can really... Uh, 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 condition control is evolving, ultimately, and we know that we want to uh, we want to reduce these variations in round-up time. Um, but at uh, times of... Uh, uh, times of deep congestion, we are likely to... We are going to see those sorts of variations. Um, where there are buffers, we will see them, and there are deep buffers. So I think your question was, what do we do about the the, the, the cases where there are potentially deep buffers, right? Right, and in in such cases, for example, like just using BBR v1, probably not the best approach, right? Um, things like that, um, and I think it might be hard to like share the data, but having like a community kind of like guidelines and a little bit thought process around, um, just like how video providers would just be able to jump in and reduce their bit rates, um, arguably. That may or may not have that much because ABR was working pretty well. Uh, what can CDNs do to either uh, store down uh, things that they can control, like file downloads and the, the cost for game downloads is not something that we can control. But what can we do to sort of alleviate some of those things in terms of congestion control for uh, especially last mile latency links uh, and some of the things that was presented yesterday kind of like indicated that, that uh, even though the link from the CDN to the ISPs were doing fine, or we, we were able to jump in and add some capacity real, real quick, the last mile is last mile. And if there's congestion there, and we're still competing with all of the CDNs and cloud providers, um, so what can we do as a community together to like uh, keep that um, fair, right, in some ways? Look, we got a bit over here. So let's take a quick five-minute break, and we come back, we've got on, on Let's see, Andra and Yari on the queue. Um, and then we can continue on with it and move the discussion over towards towards making it better after that. Does that sound good, people? See you in five.
Hey Matt. I just want to shout out through this thing. Oh, hello. What, are we 50 miles apart here? Actually, no. More like 200 miles right now. I think we're technically at five minutes, but I mean, I don't know whether no one really believes my five minutes and we should just start. Or <laughs> I think you should force people to turn their videos on. This is what my kids' teachers do anyways. <laughs> you can't, unfortunately. John, it's much brighter there than it was 30 minutes ago. Well, you know, the sun has a way of doing uh, things. <laughs> Yeah, I, I feel similarly in my head, by the way, much brighter than 30 minutes ago. Indeed. I'm looking forward to starts at 6 a.m. every morning tomorrow, uh, next week. So, uh, Andra, are you back? And you got, I think you're next up in the queue with your question. Yeah, I'm back. Can you guys hear me? We can. Thanks. Yeah, great. Yeah, so thanks so much for 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 the awesome analysis. I think that was that was amazing. And I just had a few questions for for specifically for the analysis uh, you showed for the UK because we looked at you know one of our operators um, uh, in the well O2 in the UK, and I was just wondering if we could contrast a little bit what you showed there in terms in terms of. Um, the decrease in in the throughput uh, measurements that you had, um, and the increase of the the traffic, and whether you actually broke down the analysis for mobile users and residential users. So this was the question that we got yesterday: whether we can observe this waterbed effect um, with the decrease in in you know, in the down download down, downlink volumes of traffic that we have seen in O2, with the increase um, in the residential use. And also, you know, I think it was very nice <laughs> to see the breakdown on on the um, uh, on the on the U.S. analysis. But I was also wondering if the same analysis would be interesting for the U.K. on on the breakdown of uh, revenues for different people, different regions, um, because we actually did look at you know um, the census-based information that we got. I mean, this was okay. This was the census in like 2011 because the next one is supposed to happen next year. Um, but we did see quite interesting dynamics there. So a lot of the people actually moved from London. They went to different, you know, to areas where, um, uh, like marked, you know, subur suburban or areas that were marked, um, you know, um, rural or actually <laughs> low income. It's actually a group where it's uh, they're it's called uh, challenged. Um, um, I don't really remember the actual name right now. Um, but yeah, I think it, it would be very interesting to, to contrast this and to, to look at, you know, the analysis from the point of view of the actual operator with the analysis from, from your point of view. So I'm just wondering if that's of interest to comment on that and, yeah, you know, And would you like me to answer? Uh, yeah, please. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm asking Colin if I don't know what. Oh yeah, what, no, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, just, I'm just, yeah, give us a quick answer. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, so, so at high level, yeah, we we were. I was actually very keen on looking into other parts of the the world. Um, uh, unfortunately, data for 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 sort of dividing up the 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 uh, country into these zones wasn't readily available. Um, like I said, for the US, I used IRS data that's available in BigQuery, and that was a lot easier for me to, even though it was. It's actually super interesting. If you if you ever get a chance to look at the data, they've anonymized it in a very interesting way. Um, uh, but but I couldn't find uh, similar data, even in terms of uh, um, uh, breakdown of uh, uh, breakdown to smaller enough levels. Um, 
but if there there I, I i was interested certainly at the time um i've not spent a lot of time on this since since uh, the summer but i think that'll be very interesting in general i think there is like i said there is a story here right there's a, there's a separate story here that came out of it for me at least is that there is a correlation between quality of internet uh, uh, the bandwidth uh, at a high level i wouldn't say quality generally but certainly bandwidth and uh, and and uh, economic zones so to speak uh, right. or income so, regions i'm sorry sorry go on if I, if no, I that's all. The add, income levels. If, yeah, please. If I could just add something, because we actually did look at, within the UK, you know, these uh, output areas, this is public information, and they actually tag these as the postcode level. And the postcodes, you know, in, in the UK are like a few homes, a few streets, very, very granular information. And we actually did check whether there was any bias within the way that uh, Auto deployed their network, and we couldn't find any differences, any. Um, um, you know, any sort of metric that would show this this type of bias, which was very, very good news from for for from from our point of view. However, you know, there there, there is um, still a bit of digging to do in terms of these differences between the different areas and the way that um, the people people change basically change their mobility patterns and how that impacted and whether you know hotspots actually created um, in in the mobile network. And based on our data, actually, we couldn't identify any new hotspots appearing after the lockdown, immediately after the lockdown. But I think it was a, a very interesting point that was made before, you know, whether we could actually contrast this with user experience. And this is something that we've been uh, looking at and we were trying to actually understand whether we can compare the metrics that we collect from, from the network side with the actual user experience and create basically a similarity metric that is able to tell us how our, how our users are actually experiencing uh, the service. Yeah, I, I'd definitely be interested in looking at this more uh, if there was more data. I, I, honestly, I didn't dig in and that's all I've got there. But I think there's definitely interesting stuff to look into here, uh, especially for operators. Um, I would say that at a high level, the, the, the things that one one should be careful to look at is, is, is you want to look at some notion of per capita. And that's the important part here. It's not just whether the pipes are being used to the same extent or if, if they are being used more or not. But uh, there's, I don't know how it is in the UK, but presumably there's some sort of tiered service. So that also matters when people are able to sign up for tiered services, whether, whether particular tiers are being uh, uh, exhausted more or not is something that's important to be able to see. Uh, from our point of view, we were able to see this entirely on uh, the connection level. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think there's, there's, there's definitely interesting things to look here, both in terms of network type, in terms of usage, and in terms of income levels. Yari? Yeah, I wanted to get back to your question, Colin, or observation of what was key about this network's feeling that things are fine, and then conferencing application people are feeling that, no, this is not working very well. And and that, that's very interesting, of course. Um, I think we have some sort of fundamental issues with our attempt to measure things, actually, because you typically can measure only usage, but not demand, of course. In some cases, you can see that, well, you could send more packets clearly into this unconsistent network. But, but uh, for instance, like people who aren't connected obviously aren't going to show up as you know, users of packets or their RTP can't be measured and so on. So. So that, that's an issue, but maybe that's a flip, a flip comment in, in some sense. But I actually wanted to ask a more practical question for you, Colin, that uh, when, when you work with these conferencing applications, how much do you know and how much do you get to see of the sort of the big picture of like, you know, problems could appear in many places? And like, you know, my connection here, is it, you know, is it my Wi-Fi? Is it my... Uh, ISP access network connection, is it further up in the IXP? Is the connection to the cloud farm congested or you know, limited by contract? Or is there too few instances or is the thing just too far away? And I, you know, I, I, I keep coming with different answers every time. And I have like a daily problem with, with uh, a, a certain um, conferencing application, not yours. Um, <laughs> and, 
Uh, you know, well, how that, so yeah, you know, every one I, of them. Has, yeah, I, I I I get different answers. Like I had actually like one thing that I was able to identify was that, like the the driver on my Mac OS. Um, a MacBook Air uh, computer had gone into some weird mode where it was introducing several seconds of uh, latency for, for no good reason, while the other computers were not doing that. And um, so, so how, do you need some more tools to, to figure this out, or do you think you have full picture? No, no, we don't have the tools we need at all. It's a great question. I think this is a great lead into the sort of next session of what we would be making it better. Um, one thing I will, and look, I, I, I'm, I'm speaking from point of view of WebEx, but I, I'm pretty confident that I, I have friends that are working at the other major conferencing vendors to understand they have very similar problems. Um, first of all, it's very difficult for us to char whether something went wrong on the Wi-Fi network or after that, okay? And being able to get almost the most simple metrics from the, from the access point you were dealing with would totally change our ability to guess where the problem was, whether it was Wi-Fi or, or, or on the network beyond that. Um, for the network beyond that, you asked about sort of what level we're tracking. Um, probably a lot of people on this call have used Thousand Eyes or a product like that that is taking uh, tons of metric points, you know, it's, it's, it's sending tons of probes, from a zillion different points, we're doing it from you know from all the WebEx endpoints. We're tra we we probe multiple. If you look at the WebEx traffic or any of the major vendors, they probe multiple swans of their data centers and track what type of stats they have. And then, of course, we correlate those and try and backflow through the network to understand. Oh, look! Everybody behind this particular router or your BGP control point or something like that, we we can we can see that they're having problems, and we will often be able to see where network data is. Um, you know, is being flopped on two different routes or all the different types of traffic routing things that you might see. So we can correlate that. We can bring it back to, um, for this particular service provider, we're seeing everybody in this sort of network block is having a similar problem. We might, we, we can often, we can often guess how a, uh, you know, a DSL or, or a cable provider has arranged their network by seeing the similar performance behind a given uh, network element that's having problems of some sort, right? So we correlate that all up, but then there's not much we can do about it. Uh, often we can't even figure out who we would contact at those companies to, to figure it out. And that's one of the things that changed during COVID was our ability to go like, we're seeing a problem in your network. If I'd done that, if I'd seen that, we're having a real problem in this space here, it's causing issues for customers. A year ago, if I'd had that problem, they would have been like, yeah, log a ticket. Um, and now it's like, okay, let me look into that for you. It was like a real, real shift there. So. Um, anything that we could do to get a little bit more visibility into particularly whether the problem was Wi-Fi or after the Wi-Fi would help because no one has any clue. The applications don't have any clue on that. Maybe the OS vendors do. Um, and then be able to actually talk a little bit more realistically about the network measurements. I mean, we, we were thinking about the things we do make it difficult for the service providers to actually understand whether our applications are working well or not. I mean, multiple of the video conferencing providers right now claim they can do fairly high resolution video conferencing with 50% packet loss. I mean, that should freak us all out. Um, I don't think it's exactly true, luckily, but the fact that they're claiming this is really disturbing. <laughs> um, it, you know, and, and everybody is, um, is super aggressive about the amount of forward error correction things to do. For, for example, right now, WebEx spends more bandwidth on audio than it does on video. Okay, that's how much error correction is being slammed into the audio. Um, so, and we're not alone in that space, right? Um, so I, I think that anything we could do to sort of figure out where problems were and, uh, and be able to give information about how to to make that information actionable in some ways to try and figure out how people how you might get that to the person who would care about it um, would be really valuable. Uh, I think I, if I haven't lost track of the queue, I would say uh, uh, Jan is on it again next. <laughs> Yeah, Karen, you I just want a clarification of what you just said. Did you did I hear you right? Maybe I didn't. Did you say that you're spending more bandwidth on audio than on video? Yep, that's what I said. I know, sort of that I'm should be digesting that. <laughs> so uh, if I can, because that I mean, 
that surprised me for a second when I heard it, and then I then it unsurprised me just because like the the tolerance of audio failure is way less than the tolerance of video failure for for good QoE, right? Like so, if you're pixelated, who cares? But you know, if you said launch the missiles, then that's a problem. Um, so the this actually lines up with some some QoE you know issues I've had on various conferencing platforms, not yours. Um, uh, with respect to like actually keeping the latency in sync, right? Like, so I've seen the the big thing that I ran into on one unnamed provider as soon as like COVID went bad was I got up to like half a second of desync from the video and the audio. Um, and I'm guessing that was, so thank you for explaining what caused that to happen. Um, I mean, it's just the, the, the FEC buffer is just huge, right? I mean, yeah, I, I mean, and, and everyone's gone to that. And and look, Donna, I'm not arguing that's a good plan that we're doing that either. I, I disagree with it in many ways. But when when people are like, well, what, what when you have a set of engineers that are, let's say, engineers are not deeply involved in network control who, who are given the problem, make this work with 50% packet loss. Guess what they would do? Yeah, that's what they did. <laughs> Well, and, and, and therefore, therefore uh, ended up with 70% packet loss. But exactly, yes. But, but, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and now the challenge was, how do you make it work at 70% packet loss? And there we go, <clears throat> chasing our tail again. But but I, I'm surprised just very quickly not to, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised that the audio stream is more important. Obviously, yeah, that makes a ton of sense that that's what you want to do. What I'm surprised still is that the bandwidth I would have imagined that the, the audio stream bandwidth was substantially lower than the video stream. So I don't know how much FEC they're packing or the video quality is across the board. Are people just like turning off their video uh, uh, and therefore the video bandwidth is effectively lower? I'm not, I'm trying to just put square those things away in my head. Right. So I, I'll get, I'll, there's no one else on the queue, so I'll talk a little, I'll just answer a little bit. Sorry. Um, the type of audio quality we're having right now, just the raw audio quality is about 30 kilobits per second um, for Opus. That's about what the codec would take at that level. This level of video that you're seeing right now is probably around, uh, for each one of these thumbnails, around maybe, I, I don't know, you could probably do yeah. 120, 300 kilobits, something like yeah. that. Um, a lot of these services will use somewhere between 500 and a couple, two, three megabits per second overall. And mm -hmm. the rumor of like, turn off your video, it improves things usually isn't really all that true because most of the services, um, they're, they're transcoding in the cloud. And if, if one person on this calls video, is the network is really crappy, we'll just slow down the video to that person, not everyone. So it's, it's um, video on or off makes less difference than you might think. Yeah, I'm, I, yeah I've, I've been watching the, you know, if you're running on a machine, you go to like, you go to help health checker and see like the Webex stats and you can see it's, you know, ranging anywhere from 600 kilobits to 900 kilobits. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty good. Although I'm, I'm bursting up to sending a megabit and a half of video right now. So. Uh, so, uh, but to your point, like the amount of the, the, when 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 people have a thirty bit a thirty kilobit per second audio stream and they are fecking it up to close to a megabit, that's a fair amount of feck. <laughs> so that's in queue. Did you? <laughs> uh, what I mean, I, this gets really questions of like, look, we're we're going to run out of time here soon. Um, you know, what are some of the big issues that came up overall, not just this video conferencing problems. I'm, I'm happy to talk about my problems all day. Um, and, uh, you know, what are some things that we could do to improve stuff? I mean, let's, uh, you know, jump on the queue and give us your 10, you know, let's hear from some people we haven't heard from here. I wanted to make an observation that I first noticed um, decades ago, and that is there's a human control system, which is um, there's a, always some heavy high intensity, high resource consumptive service that's also sensitive to usage and people don't do or don't use it according to whether or not how well the internet performs. And that makes space for all the smaller services. And, you know, turning off 4K video, for instance, it just makes perfect sense. And one 4K video session is a significant number of other, other, other users. Um, and you need to remember that companies like 
Google and Netflix, we also have other our own users doing other things, and we don't want to interfere with our own traffic. So it makes perfect sense. The other cases, Google has turned down YouTube, for instance, when there has been earthquakes severing multiple transoceanic cables and just turn it off because um, it makes space. Um, the other thing I want to do observe is there's a there's a wonderful story. I don't want to tell it in full, but I'll, I'll give you the punchline now. Several decades ago, there was one month somebody saw a lot of traffic in the unknown port category in an IDS system. It was port 80. And the doubling time for that traffic was six months. And the internet kept it up for 10 years. And it went, port 80 went from a majority, minority of the traffic to a majority of the traffic. And there was a time that the internet traffic growth was doubling every seven months. That's only slightly faster than happened in March. Excuse me, only slightly slower than happened in March. Um, and there were a lot of lessons learned, and there are engineers at all the large ISPs who've been through those years and um, have experienced other forms of success disasters where you expect a thousand customers and you get a million customers or other things like that. Um, the pouring concrete and pulling conduit are slow and, and um, can't be hurried much but turning up equipment can be done much more quickly. And there's a bunch of strategies and such. I, I'm not an ISP, but there are people on this call who understand these things. I made the statement earlier that I think the internet worked as intended. So, Christy, you brought up the topic of security impacts on the network. You want to talk about those a bit? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to talk because we've talked a lot about like observations and stuff. And obviously, in the UK, NCSCs, we have a security specific viewpoint. Um, and so, yeah, I suppose more than just kind of shifting to home working generally, where obviously there are new uh, types of attacks you can get, new footholds, a lot of IT departments rolling out um, new equipment quite rapidly. A lot of them using VPN access and stuff for the first time, um, some vulnerabilities in those VPNs and stuff. There's obviously quite a big shift just in terms of home working. Um, but we also saw, because of the COVID specific aspect, that because there was a global pandemic on, um, the users that we would see using a network would be different in terms of their security posture, in terms of their kind of awareness, and even quite sophisticated users were generally a bit more vulnerable in a pandemic situation. So a bit more um, isolated or a bit more eager for, for news. Um, so just kind of a, a difference really in, in terms of how um, vulnerable users were to manipulative techniques um, like scams, fraud, uh, and that kind of stuff. So I suppose um, for us, the network impact, you know, generally there was a real, we, we talk about the, the capacity build and the speeds and the volumes and the internet's ability to cope with that, I, I think that's all excellent, like I really do. And that's just testament to the years and years of work that's gone into this. And like you said, those industry relationships spinning up and being quite agile and how we worked. Um, from the security side of things, I think we just saw a huge spike in fraud and scams related to COVID um, and a whole new set of attacker behavior to, to combat, including new targets like vaccine laboratories and stuff to protect um, and, and as well as this like big shift to home working and, and VPN um, spin up and, and stuff like this. So um, I guess I suppose the network impact like for, for COVID from our point of view um, was just really this huge, huge um, new security effort that was needed and the security industry is always quite agile. We're, we're always sharing and kind of thinking about the greater good and um, you know sharing any attack techniques that we find and uh, ways that people can defend through indicators of compromise as a common technique. One thing um, that the NCSC did specifically was to start um, launch our suspicious email reporting service. So a lot of people were getting an initial fish um, through email and uh, it would be something like, you know, tax rebate for, for COVID or whatever, or, you know, all the sort of government schemes that were going on. And then um, recognizing the way that users were more vulnerable um, generally, and some may be more likely to click than in a normal non-pandemic time. 
Um, this service, the idea is that people can report it, so more advanced users can report it, and then those sites can be taken down um, where they are malicious, so that it's protecting kind of the herd. It's like this herd immunity kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, so that's one initiative that we we started, but that's obviously quite a low level manual intervention. And so, I suppose just as an open question, like, would would that work as well if if there was another kind of pandemic or another kind of situation like like we're experiencing now, um, as people shift to home working, you know, were there lessons that we could have taken from the security impact? Um, I know that a lot of people kind of rolled out their their enterprise infrastructure quickly. And uh, yeah, it was just just a whole new set of things com coming out that maybe we could just look at a bit um, from a security point of view. It's kind of what I wanted to start a discussion on. I don't know um, if anyone else experienced similar things. So, so look, I, I'm just gonna. It, Stephen, can you just jump the queue and ask your question for to, to Christy here, and then I'll, then we'll get back onto the proper order of the queue. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, Christy, I was just wondering, um, do do we have evidence of the, of the of an increase in fraud attempts, or whether what happened was displacement of people trying to to attempt fraud via other cover mechanisms towards attempting to use COVID as a cover for their fraud? So your question is like, does the total number of attacks increase or was it just roughly the same level of attacks but more people using COVID as a cover? Yeah, about fraud. Okay, for fraud. Yeah, so we saw, I mean, we can speak to like government experience there because um, we obviously protect like government domains and government brands. So where there are things like uh, tax, people saying, oh, it's the tax office, you know, you're due a rebate. Um, we can speak to that. So we saw a spike um, for government domains being used, um, in t like for yeah, particularly for fraud, um, using COVID as a as a cover. Um, part of that, I think, is that we already take, have taken down quite a lot of existing fraud sites that make use of kind of government brands. Um, comes under copyright actually, which is quite amusing. Um, but yes, yeah, so, you know, I don't I don't know if the total number of fraud attempts um, increased. But just I do know there was a pivot that we were discovering new indica indicators of compromise all related to COVID. So one statistic that we put out in our annual review um, was that we supplied 51,000 indicators of compromise to the NHS that were co in our COVID response. Um, so yeah, a lot of them are kind of the domains of things you know like uh, yeah, all, all coronavirus or COVID-19 related. Terms of like attack um, target that did that did pivot, um, so we saw attacks on areas that we've never seen attacks on before, like vaccine research institutes, um, increased pressure on NHS and other those kind of health centre centric sectors. Robert, are you still on the queue? I, I am. I was going to ask uh, or raise a top, diff, different topic about gaming, but just to go back to Kirsty's point, one question I have is whether there's any way or any help of trying to solve some of the security things at the DNS level. Yeah. So, for example, like OpenDNS, now Cisco Umbrella, where it's able to, um, through seeing a lot of the DNS queries, um, spot potentially new domains that are coming on that might be compromised, and hence you only need a few people to be marking these as potentially compromised and protecting a lot more people. So, so the same idea of what you're saying about um, people raising, flagging up these emails that are compromised um, and contain um, uh, attacks and things, effectively to be able to do some sort of network level thing where you get that same sort of protection through various people saying and sharing their knowledge that this is, this is dubious. And the same same idea, I guess, with Gmail, I believe, where they, where they have um, a lot of ability to filter emails because they see a lot of the spam being sent to lots of people, and hence they have extra knowledge about um, the spam emails being sent to lots of people, and hence can filter it at sort of almost like the network layer, the application layer, rather than each individual person saying, wait a minute, I want to filter this, this is spam email. I mean, 
shall I shall I answer that? Yeah. Sure, if you got a quick yeah. comment on replying to that, yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, we just said that we have the protective DNS service in the NCSC, which is a DNS level um, filtering system that covers all government domains. So where we do have uh, indicators of compromise, like um, I don't know, like fraudulentcovid.com or whatever, um, we can just deploy that and it, it protects the fleet of um, enterprise devices for government. So we found DNS filtering like that to be a very, very powerful um, tool. It's not like perfect and it's not delicate, it's quite coarse, but it, is, it does really work for us. We've got loads of stats on the, on the topic, which I'll happily share after this. Matt? Oh, sorry, maybe I, I misunderstood somebody's plus one back there. Okay, um, Alicia, I think it's you. Next. Okay, um, I think my comment is somewhat different, but let me try it anyway. So uh, regarding security, I'm, actually my observation is mostly about the application level security. As everyone knows, uh, at the very beginning of the COVID, when uh, we moved to uh, online teaching, there was a huge surge about the Zoom bombing. You know, this whatever people attacked the Zoom. Uh, but uh, that was during our spring quarter teaching. So the one, when we started the fall quarter uh, back in August, no, not August, October, just the one that was writing the submission of a white paper to this workshop. On that same day, the original deadline, we got another uh, pledge from the campus warning us that there is a huge Zoom bombing again coming in. So at this time, I think I didn't hear from others as a serious problem. It was a problem at UCLA. And uh, this is kind of uh, anecdotes plus speculation. UCLA is you know, bigger campus, we teach kind of different things from foreign languages to the performing arts. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's some faculties that are not really know the the use or safe use of networking that well. So that uh, um, for those people, they might not have good uh, precautions or practice, best practices handling their issues, the online life. But uh, previously, whatever they do is only affected themselves. But now everyone actually performing their job online and their lack of understanding of security brought up the big issues. So I, I, in my submission, we raised the question, who is ultimately responsible for application security? Uh, are we expecting every single human being that everyone will be online to get a security training to pick the strong password? Is that where we are expecting 10 years down the road to secure applications? Or this actually is a fundamental problem here that's a that requires technical solutions. Uh, that is my uh, first comment. There's a second comment that I just want to mention it. Zoom is not a stranger to us. You know, I've been using Zoom for uh, online master program for six years or five years, some long time. And then nobody cared about uh, attacking it until it became the first line of tools for uh, home networking, maybe for home working. I wonder whether the other tools just lying there and their security vulnerabilities were now are not known until when they, they become first line applications. And that is my big worry as, as I see Zoom as an example, I'm done.
So I, I think that's a, a great set. I'm going to put myself on the queue here. And I think this is a great segue and time to move into the sort of, you know, what things that we could do better. So, I mean, some of this is, is users changing, no question about it, and learning new tools and new things, um, ad adapting to things. Um, but I think some of it too, like to answer your question about passwords there, I mean, you, you know, from a technical point of view, one of the things that we could do is, is build our, is, is figure out how to make it possible to not have passwords. <clears throat> and look, I understand there's a lot of work going on in passwordless right now. Um, so, but I mean, I, I think that that's the things, the type of things I'd like to talk over about for the next 15, 20 minutes or so is what are what are ideas that come out of the papers that were submitted to this conference or things that people have seen that are things that the technical community, the internet, the ITF um, might work on to make things better? So let me just open it up with that. Uh, let's see, I've lost track. Of There's my cue. <laughs> okay. Um, Jana. Thank you, Colin. Um, so uh, this is something that I've been thinking about for a little while, but but it's become more even pressing. In these days. I'll be quick. At a high level, one of the big things that we're missing, and I think we you touched on this earlier, is about observability. Um, we all have our own little lenses through which to see the internet, but we don't have a good understanding of what uh, the overall thing from a user's perspective is we all have again only those who run client applications have that but they don't know what's happening in the network for instance um this has always been true and this has always been true because uh, 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 when people run experiments for example if an operator runs an experiment they look at their own little benchmarks to figure out whether the experiment is changing things or not all the while the metrics they are using may not or may have inverse correlations with quality of service from the quality of experience of the uh, the uh, the user um, we've seen this in the past uh, this particularly has been true with uh, uh, with middle boxes that uh, that that terminate tcp connections that's just one example um, um, that uh, oftentimes are, are bought and sold because they seemingly improve uh, usage of network uh, uh, at an operator. At the same time, um, I'm familiar with some experiments that actually try that demonstrated that that uh, video streaming quality of experience increased by over 10% when they bypassed some of these boxes that an operator had deployed. Um, so there's 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 a huge there's a huge uh, um, um, Sort of, sort of a mismatch, right? Operators and and endpoints, clients, servers. There are at least three, maybe more parties that have uh, different viewports into this world. They have different incentives. Of course, I don't know how we can align all the incentives together, but at a minimum, if we can get observability, I don't know how to do how to solve this problem. It's, and it's not a small problem. I, I I I don't think it's a small problem, anyways. But if there's a way for us to understand how end to end things uh, uh, are affected. In these days, in particular, especially through COVID, it have been super useful. Um, but that's something we are missing. We are missing, except for when people like us, some of us get together and sort of share our data with each other. That's the only way we know. Um, it'd be a lot nicer to be able to do this more broadly and programmatically. Nisha? And I'd like to follow up your comment to say we should uh, move away from depending on user selected uh, security as like a first line of, you know, fighting against uh, the attacks. But that's exactly how uh, I think we do have a big problem that is, I don't see a clear framework on how this is internet security actually is a coherent system. I think currently we have peace mills. There is this, uh, okay, secure the China. But then secure the China lead to this uh, uh, unscalability because no one can, we cannot allow everyone to connect to the servers. So that's how fast they come into business, you know, providing middle boxes. If we go down continuously along the current path, this architecture that was designed 40 years back, point-to-point -point connection, it's inevitable we get to go down the further direction of more and more middle boxes. It's, this is the architecture we want to see 40 years down the road. And uh, I 
Jana, Jana, I, I saw you actually have a talk on the YouTube about the end-to-end -end internet is gone. Uh, I was going to actually have a chat with you when, when I get the chance out of the busy teaching. Um, is the end-to-end -end internet gone? And why? I think it's a big architecture question, and the IAB should take it out. Uh, Brian. Let me stop typing for a minute. Um, so uh, I would endorse John's point. Uh, it's, you know, a, a super difficult problem and one that I hope to actually come back to work on at some point um, is how can you balance, like, um, you know, the end-to-end -end observability where end and end are basically sort of semantic things on either side of the network that the network is going to affect with, you know, privacy and security, right? Because, like, the, the easiest way to do this would be, like, everybody gets, I mean, you open everything up, right? Like, so TCP was nice and observable, but you can't build a, you can't build a network that's not going to be interfered with uh, on top of TCP, as we found from the middle box question. The other thing I wanted to go back to, um, I think it was Andrew's question at the very beginning of today, because I had a, a, a thought about this as I was uh, looking at some of the data um, and looking at the data from from yesterday. Is we should be very careful about um, how we measure the efficiency of the network. Because I think, you know, there's a, uh, there's sort of rules of thumb in, in um, provisioning the backbone that says, well, you're going to have 30% year in your growth, you need to have 30% slack. And that was the slack that kept us from dying in those days when everyone was asking, oh my God, are we going to be able to handle this? Um, if you look at some of the work in data center networking, if you look at some of the work like in, in software defined uh, internet working, one of the, the hopes that 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 work rests on is that better control will allow us to get rid of these these overheads uh, in the network um, because we'll just be able to run things hotter. Um, like you know taking you know taking experience from data center networks which run significantly hotter uh, than the public internet does, uh, and it it um, you know we can't actually say how much of a safety um, safety margin we need in order to be able to pull off something like oh another COVID. Um, but observability would get us the numbers where we know, like what the difference is between safe efficiency and unsafe efficiency. Now, I don't, I don't see like, you know, even as the the co-chair of the Path Forward Networking Research Group, I don't actually see sort of these technologies being deployed in the internet uh, at some point where the efficiency would significantly threaten um, sort of the resiliency of the network. But it's something to keep in mind. Uh, Jason. Sure, thanks. So um, a few uh, comments and maybe some areas to mark for improvement. You know, one, I think, um, as uh, maybe it was Stephen joking at the start, you know, if this had happened a decade ago, we might have been fairly screwed. But, you know, this was a, a remarkable success. The fact that, you know, this huge shift occurred and the Internet basically worked and supported all this video traffic is pretty awesome. Um, so I think that's a... a a big success that um, you know wasn't mirrored in other areas of the economy, like you know couldn't get paper towels for three months or something like this. So it's uh, it's a big difference. In terms of improvement, though, I, I want to echo some comments others made about measurement and observability. On some level, I think we get what we measure. Um, it's sort of like uh, you know if you give a, a salesperson um, a commission for selling something, they're going to sell more of it, right? So if you measure something, um, you're going to get people to focus on it and work to improve it. So I think having some um, new measurements here are beginning to shift focus away from purely um, sort of capacity measures is uh, really important. So I think that's one area that we can improve. And perhaps building in, as others said here, observability inherently in some of the um, protocols or, or even the end-to-end -end applications. You know, certainly QOE measures are something that, say, a WebEx operation would see for their clients. Netflix would see it for their clients. But how much of that QE data might be exposed um, for others to be able to measure and analyze is unclear. I think, you know, very little or, or none. 
Um, I think it also points out, um, maybe going to um, Jenna's slides, you know, that there's a bit of a, a gap here in terms of policymakers and regulators understanding of how the network actually works. Um, not clear that they really understood the rise of adaptive bitrate um, sorts of things and the fact that, you know, maybe their, their actions would literally have no effect. Um, you know, they were thinking of a network in a different era. Um, but I also wonder, and I think this is maybe understudied, I think maybe more sort of economic analysis has to occur to see, you know, why wasn't there additional capacity freed up in those markets? Is there a structural difference in the way that capacity investments are made or incented? Um, so some of that, you know, is probably something for uh, maybe uh, economists to study. And then the last comment is, I do think that there are probably, Colin, to your point about forward error correction, some what might seem very nuanced points of feedback that need to occur, but but very important ones. So I feel like we're missing a feedback loop. You know, if we if you thought of like we're all one global DevOps team, right? We still have this split between some architects someplace and people operating. And it seems like there's this feedback loop that's missing uh, back to some of the, the app developers that are maybe overusing things. And it reminds me a little bit of a few years ago when, you know, uh, maybe uh, chipset vendors were building in huge buffers and we were like, no, why are you doing that? Like, stop giving me three second or five second buffers. Like, that's counterproductive. So I feel like we have to find those feedback loops that are missing and help close that loop um, as we have everybody from across the ecosystem here. Thanks. <laughs> That's a great comment. I <laughs> hope those all made it to the notes. Uh, <laughs> Robert, you want to talk, bring us back to gaming a bit, and then I think after that we'll go over to what next. Uh, well, maybe these are what next uh, comments. So on the gaming, I so one question I had um, for Yana was was whether the pressures he was having were ones at the network layer or on the servers for when they were handling these large downloads of of new games and things, and then. Uh, from a sort of practical point of view, although we could potentially re-engineer the internet to handle some of these things better, a more pragmatic approach could be to actually for the ITF to produce some uh, informational guidance about the impact these large downloads are having uh, and to give some potential advice to um, the games writers and things and the people who are providing this sort of infrastructure um, to give them some advice on potentially how to write these things in a way that has is less impactful on the network and other users of the network. So uh, it's, it's not such a great, uh, lovely technical solution, but it might be quite a pragmatic solution to maybe improve uh, uh, the network's usage for all users. Makes sense. So look, I want to switch to a different thing here. I want to uh, tee up Stephen, Stephen for a second to talk about what do we want to do on Friday? Um, we didn't really get too much to the topic today of, wow, it's amazing the internet didn't die. What, you know, this, this went great. We should probably talk a little bit more about that, but I think there's probably some other things we should talk about on Friday. Um, we're, we're, Stephen, what do you want to say about this? Let's let's start there. I think Maria was in the queue. So I don't know if you if you go first and then finish off by talking about Friday. Sorry, uh, if you, if, I missed you. Uh, Go ahead. No problem. If you want to take the last ten minutes, then I can also wait. Oh, just with that time, go make your comment. I, I just, okay. I, it's my stupidity. I just missed it. <laughs> yeah, I was sorry in the middle, and by now I think most of my comments were made by other people. But I wanted to say, mainly from yesterday, I had two main observations. One thing is that we kind of everybody looks at their isolated metric, and we really need to share the data and look at everything together. And then also um, that we actually had problems to to measure the user experience rather than like we, we measure what we can measure, but we it's not sure we measure the right thing. So um, in that sense, I think we actually need to do some work um, to not only focus on the aggregated data, but also look at the cases where you know people have um, detected problems and make sure we get the right measurement data at the right corner. Uh, and that probably only works if we can somehow integrate more measurement capa 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 capabilities into our traffic so we can retrieve the data when we need the data. And then also have some kind of more automated way to share the data. Like you don't have to put all the data to everybody, but you have to collect the data at the endpoints or whatever and then make them available when you need them and make it in an automated way because coming together in a, in a call like this and just talk about it doesn't work all the time and is very slow. So that's where we could do some protocol work, I think. 
And one minor point where I don't have a solution to it all is also somebody made the comment that we just measure uh, what how the network is used, but we don't have a way to measure how the met how people would like to use the network. So you know what's missing, like what what what's the additional capacity, what's the additional thing people need, and that's more a social question than a technical question, maybe, but it's also an important point. Those were excellent points. Um, so actually, before we jump to, to Friday's schedule, anyone want to jump in with a last comment? <laughs> going, going, gone. Okay, so now I'm handing it over to you for tomorrow for Friday's schedule. We have Lisha now. <laughs> oh nope, sorry. There's a, ah, I'm so good. Lisha, please. <laughs> I'm so sorry for being an outlier. Uh, take you two more minutes. So I think it's, it seems like that there's a big focus about hey, can we push? If we can do that, it seems that that's our only job. Is that the case for this workshop? Just that we can deliver packets. No, no. I mean, I, I'm I'm interested in the experience we can deliver, not 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 the packets. <laughs> so I think like some of the comments I made about like sharing uh, the actual experience at the user and measurement data from the user, whatever, it does apply also to higher layer protocols and potentially even to security uh, problems we have. So we maybe can think about it in a broader scope. Um, so, so basically, that's my 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 observation of the day. Yeah, how packet get delivered and how capacity can keep up. Uh, but I think that there's much deeper problems we're facing as for security. Talk to people who handle DDoS today. How much margin they have holding things up? I, I think it's a much bigger problem. Uh, and the, the, the COVID made the system more kind of vulnerable. Because we have more dependency, I would say, not to say made the system more vulnerable. We have much bigger dependency on the internet now. Uh, my son is a doctor, and uh, you know, the, the lately, the ransom attacks went to hospitals. Uh, you can, I would use that as an excuse to say that's COVID related, but that's really a more general observation, which our places, applications become critical. That's where that tech go. Um, when and where we're going to address that much, much bigger question. So maybe um, I, I do agree. I think there is a much bigger question we need to tackle. I'm not sure if we can or like i think this was a problem that was there before it just got even more obvious in the current situation but like there have been attacks on hospitals and these kind of things before we knew before that this is a critical infrastructure um there's more work to do but i don't think or like for me the the learnings from like this crisis weren't too too big uh because i knew before there's a problem so for me that's a separate problem to tackle i think but this is just the, give you yet another evidence of the severity of the problem. I agree to that, yes. Yeah, so, so I, I think mean, you have one really way. key point there, which look, all of these security problems that we've seen in COVID, every one of them pretty much we've seen before that, the scams, the fraud, everything, variants of them, right? Your point was that, that I think the most important point is that the internet has become more critical than ever before during this time, right? That there was an actual shift for a lot of the population. I mean. So uh, I even agree to that point because like people notice it, right? Like they 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 have been using it every day, right? But like if we would have had an, an internet breakdown like a year ago, that would have been like equally bad for our economy and everything, right? So it has been critical before. I agree with all of sure. it. The question is whether I don't mean to say this should solve the problem, but shouldn't we use this COVID incidents as a wake up call? And then start thinking about the big question, not to say solve this at this workshop. Fair. I, I think uh, <laughs> we should all be solving the big problems. <laughs> um, but let me let me just because we've only got five minutes left here. Let me jump back over to what are we going to do Friday? So, handing it over to you, Stephen. Okay. So, I, first of all, I assume we do want to talk Friday because we're kind of running out of time here. 
But let me just pause for a second to see, does anybody want to say we should not meet Friday? I'm hearing nothing. Uh, okay, so uh, let's so let's have a session Friday. It may or may not last two hours. I'll give it some thought and have a look through the notes, see if there are topics that are kind of obvious. The observability one and seems like it might be at least. Um, if anybody has other topics, then just if you want to send me a mail, um, I'll send it to the t the, the program committee list. Uh, if you have like five minutes worth of slides, we could do a couple of those. Um, and I'll send out a mail or with you know with some suggested agenda tomorrow at some stage. Uh, and if anybody has a, a agenda topics that haven't come up yet that they want to suggest right now, uh, go right ahead. We have a minute or two left. Or if they have a better plan. Um, one agenda topic that I would be curious in, in getting this group's feedback on if there is time for it, and this is just not, not just my as an individual contributor here, uh, is whether today across many service providers, so we see whiting out of diff surf gloss markets and whether there might be an incentive to not white them all out or allow some to get to go through or just discuss costs a little bit. I mean, that's a, that's a topic that if we have time for, I would like to talk about a little bit. And I'm perfectly happy to put together a single slide that helps explain it. Cool. Uh... So any others not right now or? Oh, sorry, Jared, yeah. We have Jared and then Janet. Uh, sorry, I was just, I was typing, um, I typed my issue. Uh, Colin, can you share that slide with me? Because I'd kind of like to put a counterpoint slide for why service providers have to clear out those marks at their administrative boundaries. Awesome, I'm making a phone call with you later. We'll do slides jointly. <laughs> That's great. Jana? Diff serve cage fight. Put Colin and Jared in the room. Uh, um, I was going to ask if, if uh, um, Stephen, I, I'm assuming maybe you're already planning this as well. Very quickly ask, are you planning to have some sort of sort of action items coming out of this workshop? Uh, I missed Monday, but I intend to be there on Friday. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess we wanted to identify possible topics to, to work on, any conclusions we can reach. Um, you, the recording for Monday is available. It's on, it's on YouTube, so you can watch it back. Um, there was, I mean, you know, there was a bunch of other measurement kind of topics. Um, yeah, if we can reach conclusions, that would be a good thing. Uh, I think somebody earlier said that we should all vote for the internet was great, and then we'd probably, we'd probably agree on that. Um, but other more, more interesting conclusions would be good too. Yeah, I'm thinking more about like concrete things that we could actually do. I mean, if we're identifying areas of, that we could work on. I wonder if we could turn those into actually concrete things. But that's a suggestion. Uh, is that you volunteering to look over the notes for such things and propose them? Yeah, fair. Great. Excellent. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you could, if you look over the notes in the pad um, and, and see, I mean, I guess the one that strikes me from today was this observability as a thing to design in, maybe, um, to think about that some, how to do it in a privacy-friendly way, in an efficient way, and so on, a useful way. Um, so, y yes, I think if we can identify action items, that, that will be good. I'm just uh, asking you put some time on the agenda for Friday. But... Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, I don't see anybody else in the queue. And if any, we're at a minute two. If anybody wants to just grab the mic, now's your last chance. Cool. Otherwise, I guess I'll send mail tomorrow at some stage and we'll all chat again on Friday. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. See you Friday. Thanks, everyone, for the great session. Thank you. See you Friday. Thank you. Bye bye. So Thank you.